Welcome everybody to the Renegade HPG podcast. This is Travis and my guest today is Alex Iglesias. Known by many through his tag Flying Debris, Alex has illustrated many of the iconic covers that grace modern Battletech source books and box sets. As concept artist for MechWarrior Online, he has redefined the look of battle mechs for an entire generation of the IP's online devotees. In today's episode, we'll explore Alex's fandom and how he translates the Battletech universe into the visual medium for its fans. Alex, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Uh, so I had a question that uh, I keep meaning to kind of uh, ping on the uh, the artists that I have online, but uh, I always wonder kind of what is the relationship between kind of you as an artist and your real name and uh, and the tag that you use. You know, for you, it's flying debris, and you know everybody kind of has their own, whether it's the event on or art station. You know, kind of what what inspires that, and kind of when when is the appropriate time for guys like me crediting you to use Alex versus uh, flying debris? Debris. Uh, I don't know, I like Alex or flying debris. It's kind of interchangeable. I guess at this point, yeah. uh, I've just been using the name so long. Um, it, it was just, it started off as a, you know, just a weird little joke on myself. Um, like I, I used to play a game called Road Rash, the motorcycle game. You fought other people on motorcycles and, you know, you hit stuff in the scenery and you'd go flying off into the air down the road. And, you know, I, I just kind of, replaced player a with flying debris guy as you know just like a funny thing and i just kept on using it or shortening it to flying debris uh you know over the years and afterwards and just started adding it to my you know art I've just been drawing for as long as i could remember so i just kind of just appended that name to my art and it just stuck that way so yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, um, you know, has that art always been centered around kind of in, in Mecca or are there kind of other things that, you know, that you like to do kind of when you're not in your, in your professional capacity? I would say mostly, mostly Mech stuff. Um, like when I was younger, I had like a few phases and stuff. Like, like when I was really, really young, it was usually just drawing whatever game I was playing at the time. Um, so it might be cars or it might be stuff with dinosaurs or whatever. But for some reason, the mech stuff just kind of stuck. And I think by the time I was in, in college, it had waned a bit. But like, as soon as I got out, like I went hard back into it again. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it's just one of those things that, uh, just kind of feels natural to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I guess if I'm, if I'm not doing mech stuff, I might be just doing, I sometimes do like little funny doodles of, you know, like in the, uh, the Pathfinder campaign that I'm in, I'm often doing like doodles of what happens to our group every now and then. Um, but yeah, I, I prefer doing mech stuff, I guess. And how do you first kind of stumble into the Battletech universe? So, like when I was, oh God, it must have been sometime around like the second or third grade, uh, like the, uh, the cartoon had been out around that time. I think the Sega Genesis game had been out around that time. And the, I think uh, MechWare 2 Mercenaries, no, MechWare 2 Mercenaries would have been later. But I think uh, one of the earlier Mech Warrior games, um, I think had been out around that time. And I think my uncle had it. Uh, and I would later figure out how to play it. He was like one of the first people in our family to have a gaming computer. Yeah. And like he was still in high school at the time. So whenever I would visit grandma, uh, you know, I'd mess on his computer when he wasn't on it. And, um, you know, play his games and for whatever reason like mech were two mercenaries just kind of like stuck in my imagination yeah um i just started uh actively trying to consume any content i could find about it whether it was like novels or source books or whatever even though i never actually played the tabletop game or had any miniatures for like decades um 
I, I just liked collecting the books and just kind of uh, absorbing the setting or whatever. Right. Learning the history. Yeah, I talk that, about that a lot in my conversations. It's just the the multitude of vectors that people take into into the game, and uh, you know, for me, it. It, the first introduction came through tabletop, you know, with my stepbrothers when I was pretty young. I was probably like 11 or so. Um, but uh, even then, they were they were older than me, four or five years older than me. And so, you know, I wasn't definitely their 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 number one pick for who they wanted to game with when they were doing BattleTech. Um, and but uh, kind of my imagination was definitely uh, kind of. Uh, you know, sparked, you know, by then. And, and as I went through high school, it was definitely, you know, I had a couple of the source books. I certainly had, you know, the original Tector readout, the old 3025, you know, with all of Dwayne Luce's stuff, but, uh, and uh, that original Mech Warrior, where I remember building character, building a character for myself a lot, a lot of character building and mech building and not actually playing them because there was no one to play them with, but it was just that process of building, uh, you know, was a ton of fun. And then the novels, you know, the novels were a big one, you know, just kind of reading through and building that universe. And it's been fun kind of going back and chatting with, you know, Mike Stackpole and Bob Charette. And I got Bill Keith coming on next month to talk about, talk to him, but uh, cause that was, that was my introduction. Um, but it was fun. And, and I was also, you know, kind of, I, you know, um, you know, did a lot of art when I was younger, you know, kind of pursuing art was kind of a, a path that I, could have taken, but didn't take, you know, when, uh, when I was young, but a uh, lot of, a lot of line art and reproductions of, uh, you know, the Crusader and Centurion and all that kind of fun stuff early on. And so, you know, it was uh, definitely a good way. And, you know, with the video games, I was the same way. So we, we definitely were not a gaming computer household, but so whenever my friends that were had, I could connect with uh, MechWarrior 2 um, or even the original MechWarrior. I have very kind of faint memories of the original MechWarrior. When it came out but uh i ended up playing it later but uh you know there was, was great games but uh and the cinemat the cinematics man the cinematics were oh, amazing yeah. on that you know, mech, <laughs> the, you're talking about the mechware 2 mercenaries uh, i uh, love the so, intro for that <laughs> yeah it's so it's so good and uh yeah there's a there's a um uh, Art of Battletech on Twitter has been doing a lot of upscales of uh, of the various artwork that's out there, and he's he had done the, some the AI play. stuff. Yeah, the AI upscales, and he did those uh, those two trailers, and he's he was actually announced that he was going to do, or in a comment he said he was going to do that for the animated series. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to him. I was like, oh, man, I would love to kind of work together and, and host this for you to, if you don't have a YouTube channel, because I hadn't put together um, the YouTube channel he had for the other stuff uh, with his uh, Twitter tag at that point. And he was, you know, he was all for it. So we're working together to get a newly, not perfect, but really darn close, you know, re to, uh, uh... <laughs> re remastered of the animated series to be posted on Renegade HVG definitely before Christmas. We're, uh, we're kind of holding it because episode two is rough. All the other ones look great. Episode two is a struggle. And so we're trying to find a better copy to upscale of episode two because we don't want, we don't want people to get one episode in and then assume that the rest are going to be bad uh, because they're definitely not. They look amazing. It's fun. But uh, it'll be a good little nostalgia trip. Maybe we'll do it like every Saturday morning for a couple of weeks, just for old times' sake. You know, back when, back when we had to get up Saturday morning yeah. to watch our cartoons. <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> I remember that we couldn't just sit in front of Netflix all day like my little one does these days. Oh uh, yeah, I um, I do love how the even the Saturday morning cartoon BattleTech has been kind of folded into the canon as being a uh, as li Lyran. Uh, propaganda for kids. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, I've I've said on other podcasts. I think whoever came up with that idea is a genius and should have gotten a raise because it is you know, one of the most ingenious ways to kind of fold something in. Because because BattleTech and I was talking about that was with Tex uh, la in last week's episode. We uh, BattleTech does such a great job of not ever really retconning. You know, it's like you know once they've said something they stick with it you know and if they kind of work around it it's something like you know geod secrets where it's basically you know it's more like uh you know falsified history you know could have been you know unreliable it was, it was written yeah unreliable yeah. narrators and stuff and uh but yeah man what they did with the animated series to fold that in is brilliant absolutely brilliant i, I, love I can't it. i can't remember where i've read it i think it was a uh, one of those um chapter introduction like fluff sections in one of the rule books but i think they basically had a bunch of uh of clanners that were just like chit chatting with each other over comms while they were just sitting around bored in their mechs and they had started quoting the uh the cartoon <laughs> at each other and like making fun of it <laughs> oh man i gotta <laughs> like... find where that is that's awesome uh 
That's too good. I'll um, see if we can find it. <laughs> send me the link. I'll put it in the description if we can find it, everyone that's listening. Um, so what, uh, in terms of kind of where, you know, your, where your imagination took you um, with your arts, you know, was it, you know, did you, you know, were you inspired more just kind of reading the source books and novels or were it's kind of watching, like seeing the other artists that were putting out art at the time and kind of, you know, trying to kind of put your own, put your own spin on it, you know, kind of what, what drove you and kind of your own creative process? Uh, yeah. Um, I think it was like, yeah, it's hard to pinpoint actually. I've never really thought about it that hard. I just started, uh, you know, as I got older, I just started drawing stuff in my own style, I guess. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I was getting inspiration from a lot of the, the shapes you find on like attack choppers, tanks, mm. that sort of stuff. Um, and trying to apply some of those, uh, that design language into mechs and stuff. And initially it was just, you know, fan art type things. Mm. Um, I just kind of drew the mechs how I wanted to draw them at the time and it just kind of, yeah, felt right, felt good. Yeah. I don't know. It was just kind of a fun thing to do. And then I find myself getting actually paid to do it. And it just kind of snowballed from there, I suppose. It, it wasn't, there wasn't really any like grand plan or anything. It just kind of sort of turned out that way, I suppose. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious about that, kind of that transition for you from doing it kind of for pleasure to doing official, you know, I, I read kind of your previous interview where you basically, you know, brought your computer to, to one of the conventions and, you know, had uh, Brent, you know, standing over your shoulder yeah. to kind of see the talent. <laughs> what, uh, you know, kind of what, you know, was that transition like for you from just kind of doing on your own and kind of what adaptations did you have to kind of make to to your approach, your, to your style once, once your work started to become official versus just kind of your own, your own doodles? Uh, I would say I, I did have to, like, once I started doing more official work, I did have to, like, I guess, uh, take more care with the designs. I had to be a little bit more careful. Um, I couldn't just do whatever. Uh, and there was certainly, like, more design constraints. Um, but I don't know. Uh, it, it's not something that you actively think about, I guess, when you're in the middle of doing it. Right. It's like, oh, uh, I got to draw a hunchback now, or I got to draw an atlas now. I'm like, okay, I'll draw a hunchback, or I'll draw an atlas. And right. like, well, these shapes here don't kind of make sense, so I'm going to try and put some details in there that make it work, or uh, try to make this part make sense. Or, you know, I think this will look cooler than than the uh, than the old art, but still acknowledges the details that were in the old art. It's just sort of um, I don't know. And I was thinking, you know, that that's one of the ways that kind of your your art has been has been different in terms of you know where it's coming from because you know certainly once you tied into MechWarrior Online you know, all those concepts that you were doing had to be translated into motion in the video game. And so, yeah. you know, you're, you know, certainly kind of with the Omnimex and the early MechWarrior games, but MechWarrior Online certainly took that movement to a different level. And so for you, you know, it seems like you were, you know, among the first, if not the first, where the designs that you're coming up with truly had to work mechanically you know, yeah. in, in a very, in a realistic setting. And, and so I, I'm curious, you know, and, and a lot of your designs, you know, certainly have kind of stepped away from those original things, you know, and, uh, you know, just by fact that the original mechs don't necessarily work, <laughs> you know, in, in kind of realist when they're actually moving or animation, or whatever it may be, and, and kind of whereas yours, yours do. And so I'm curious kind of when you're, when you're in that, that process and that decision making, is there, you know, you talked about kind of looking at, you know, attack helicopters and whatnot, you know, is there, is there a degree of studying mechanical engineering or, or understanding of that and, uh, you know, understand the practical aspects of, of uh, engineering that you've had to, to develop and incorporate into, into that art? Um, 
I guess yes. Uh, the it was definitely a learning process because I'd say some of the the earlier mechs that I did for uh, for mech were online. You know, like you know, I I think they some of them had a few more gremlins than others. Some came out real good. Others, you know, there there'd be things that I would do differently if I had the chance. Like you know, some mechs I looked back and was like, oh feet could have been bigger or the feet could have been smaller or i think the proportions they could have done better and like you know obviously some of the ones like the awesome it's like oh god the thing's the size of a barn door no i shouldn't have done that um and you know certain design considerations like okay well this thing's got to be able to accept an lrm 20 here or it's got to be able to accept you know, three LRM whatever's there or, you know, a gigantic pack of lasers when maybe the original design only had one. So like there was a lot of things that over time, you know, there was extra considerations that had to be made. Um, and like how the, how the paint jobs would work on it, how the weapon holders um, would have to work to like accept different combinations of weapons or in the case of like the clan mechs, whether they had, you know, the, uh, the little extra hand bits of mm -hmm. geo in there, um, where to stick AMS pods, uh, is the cockpit too big? Is the cockpit too small? Like there's like a lot of, you know, weird things there. Um, won't say I did a perfect job, but, you know, it was it was a learning experience, I guess. Yeah. I'm happy with how most of the mechs came out. What's uh, what's kind of what's kind of your crowning achievement? What's your favorite translation there into MechWarrior Online Medium? King Crab. King Crab, awesome. Yeah, I fought yeah. very hard to get the King Crab into the into the game. It was yeah. it was a very uphill battle. I, I think I was like suggesting the King Crab for like well over a year before it ever went in. I'm like, guys, we should do the King Crab. You should do the King Crab. Do the King Crab. <laughs> Same with the Urban Mech. Urban Mech was even a tougher uphill battle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure uh, Bishop Steiner would would celebrate that uh, that push on your on your half that lobbying that lobbying effort. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, certainly, you know, kind of the that kind of iconic uh, King Crab art, you know, in the in the the fog of war is, is a great is a great one to stand out with your design there. But uh, yeah, the the old the old King Crab design, not so much. But I I have always loved the original the 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 regular crab design. You know, that was a good mm -hmm. one, and and uh, and I am a big fan of of your redesign. You know, but uh, it's uh, yeah, it's a good one. So uh, you know, you talked about kind of you know small feet, big feet. You know, too broad chested, maybe. You know, what were you know if you had a choice to kind of go back and redo, you know, what's kind of number one on that list? Hmm. Uh, honestly, I think I'd probably want to redo the uh, the Timberwolf because. Um, yeah, I think it probably could have squatted shorter and had more thinner legs. I probably chunked him up too much, and probably those uh, the side torso um, missile launchers, not the ears, but like the other ones, probably ended up too big. Like you know, stuff like that, I suppose. Well, it's you know, just from the observation, it seems like a lot of people struggle with those LRM launchers. You know, some people are just like, screw it, I'm a it's. 15, 15 holes, not even 20, you know, and it's like, no, it's, it's 20. It's gotta be, 20. <laughs> it's gotta be at least 50% of the Timberwolf uh, prime art out there has uh, has the LRM 15 on the shoulders and not the, not the LRM 20. Um, I've been doing, I've been doing a kind of a uh, redesign project for the old CCG and kind of creating like a custom, custom I've redo. Some of them. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, I got a lot of your art on it. I'll, uh, I'll pull them up here and I'll show you uh, before we sign off, you know, if you want to check them out, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, it's, it's funny you're watching it and uh, as much as I can, I try to kind of match the art to the variant that I'm putting on, but uh, and the Timberwolf definitely stands out. It's like, Oh, I can't, I can't use this. I can't use that. But uh, <laughs> one of my favorite, you know, non-standard variant cards I got out there because it is hard to find non-prime variants of Omnimex uh, for art. But uh, you're uh, the Timberwolf D, uh, the art from the, uh, I think the, what is it, the Alpha Strike, you know, source book, I think, for... The one, 
the, yes. the one where it's got ERPPCs and forward and backward launching SRMs. SRMs, yes, yes. I love that art. And I was so happy to find it and be like, oh, I can make a, an odd variant of the, of the Timberwolf here, you know, and have matching art with it. It was a, it was a triumph that, that evening, I'll, I'll tell you. It was, <laughs> uh, it was still enjoyable. I finally got to the point where I can almost get them to print because I've been trying to kind of do a little customization of the template. So it has a has a, a custom watermark for Renegade HPG and a custom rarity symbol. And, uh, and so, yeah, so that's going to be one of the early ones to, to go to print for sure. But, uh, but it's been, it's been fun, but it's revealed a lot about kind of the nuances of the art that you don't pick up kind of with a, with a, uh, a casual scan. Oh God, I still have like my, my high school era battle tech trading card collection. That was a yeah. game I did play a lot growing yeah. up. Like I actually played the CCG, well before I ever actually played the the actual proper tabletop, yeah, like me and uh, and some of my high school buddies would would play it during lunch. I sucked so bad. Like <laughs> all of my friends were like like CCG card sharks. Like they yeah. they knew those games backwards and forwards. You gave them any kind of card game, they would assemble like some killer deck, know how to play everything. And meanwhile, I was just like. I, I like this card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it looks I like cool. <laughs> yeah. I can't make my deck without this card. It looks too cool. And yeah, like, awesome. Well, we're well, definitely they're... we're definitely in the same boat there. My memory doesn't work well for uh for being top CCG player because I just I, I don't retain information that way. I'm more of a X-wing miniatures type of guy where it's a spatial movement is my strength. But, uh, but yeah, and that's kind of, that's part of why, you know, kind of, uh, I've been trying to kind of redo them because I was like, oh, well, all the good mechs, you can't play all the good mechs because they're horrible in this game. You can't even get big mechs out because they cost too much. And so I'm going to redo it. And, uh, and so that's been like my, you know, when I'm watching TV at night, you know, just kind of redesign a card. I've got, I think I'm up to like 270 cards. I've pretty much got oh, wow. a, almost a full base set of redesigned cards. <laughs> and the, uh, I actually, just the other night I finished the, uh, I have the, uh, finished all of the mechs from the uh, TRO 3050. So I've got 3025 and 3050 all done. And then, you know, a hundred other miscellaneous ones. So uh, I need to find somebody who can, uh, who can do some web design and uh, basically get a web page up and get all the cards out there. And so that people can kind of print them at home and kind of just like a low resolution. So we're not worrying about any copyright issues, put them on the tabletop and play. They can actually play some of their favorite mechs with amazing art by Alex Glacius, you know, oh. <laughs> um, uh, among many others. But, uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been fun. Actually uh, to rewind uh, just a second, I, I would say the, the card game, some of the art for that was actually, you know, something that would influence, um, you know, me in the years afterwards, like the, I can't remember the name, his name off the top of my head. It was Chris something or other, but he did the artwork for Chris Langley. Think, yeah. Yes. Chris Langley. Yeah. He yeah. did the art for, I think the, um, crossbow, I think Redline pilot, uh, the Nova prime and probably a number of others. And I remember looking at that art a whole bunch and, and trying to like, you know, learn some lessons from it, awesome. I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of people have, you know, I've kind of asked people what their favorite art is, you know, on the Battletech CCG Facebook page, you know, and uh, in some of my videos, that was kind of a focus when I was doing some, uh, some CCG topics. And uh, Langley definitely came up. It's kind of a lot of people's favorite, favorite artists there. I actually have my curated deck sitting right here beside me and the Redline Pilot's sitting right on top of that deck right now. I love Redline Pilot. You can throw yeah. him on so many things and it just turns it into like a nightmare. Yeah, he's definitely, he's definitely a favorite. Well, what's, you know, you know, talking about Clint, you know, are there any other artists, you know, kind of early artists that were inspirational for you or just, you know, kind of, uh, you know, just really favorites that you like to look back and, and kind of, uh, you know, enjoy? Uh, I'm a I'm a fan of Mark Harrison. Um, he did uh, some stuff for 2000 AD comics. Okay. Uh, he did a he did this little graphic novel that I just kind of um, found one day in a game store while my friends were playing some other stuff, and it was like a, it was called Glimmer Rats, and it was I think early examples of um, like digital art type stuff like using photoshop or whatever existed at that time for uh for painting stuff together and he also did like some of the covers for some warhammer 40k books uh like the titanicus 
um, graphic novels. And I really liked some of the effects that he got, some of the stuff he did with textures. And, you know, that was, uh, that was a direct inspiration, I think. I tried to, to recreate a lot of stuff back in around when I was in college and I just fell very short of it. But I, I, I still, you know, tried, I guess. Um, well, definitely, you know, I was kind of curious your perspective, you know, looking at kind of, you know, certainly in kind of the original Battletech artists, guys like, you know, Holloway and Levenstein and, um, you know, uh, and even uh, oh, guess, uh, Jensen, um, you know, out oh, there, yeah. you know, a, a lot of those are all, all paintings then translated in and, and now, you know, the medium has very much changed kind of the digital, you know, I'm mm -hmm. curious kind of as an artist and from a historical sense of kind of your perceptions of how that, how that evolution has kind of impacted, impacted the medium and kind of how, how you approach your art. And, you know, if, do you, if you even have skills that are outside the digital medium, if you've, if you've tried beyond, you know, line arts and, and, uh, you know, and doing that on the computer. Uh, I work so much on the computer that I've largely forgotten what like non-digital media usually feels like, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, like I, I will every now and then, I, I if I'm, if I've got like a blank piece of paper in front of me and some time to kill, I'll, you know, do some doodles and realize, oh, wait, you know, this is an actually completely different process and, you know, hammer out some doodles that normally I don't think I'd be able to do on, on digital just because the, the feeling of pencil on paper just isn't quite the same as stylus. Like you don't have the same feedback but you also can't quite do the same things as you can with, uh, with digital. So they're like very different things. Um, as far as like how it influenced the, uh, industry or, you know, that sort of thing. I think it's just a matter of just ease because if, if you already start working digitally, you don't have to worry about the hassle of scanning stuff in and, cleaning things up you just already started you know from a digital standpoint and you can send files to whoever needs them it's just considered more practical i think mm -hmm. but yeah i don't know like uh I guess, I guess if you if you really wanted to to still work with um like non-digital media like i think i think you still could It'll, it would require a little bit more work, a little bit more time. Yeah. Um, I think it's still possible, but just in terms of how the industry is, uh, I think it's usually considered just easier just to go digital. Yeah. Unfortunately. And, you know, I've noticed, and, you know, certainly the, the modern, you know, art coming out of Battletech, whether it's through Macquarie Online or HBS or Catalyst, you know, is, uh, your far higher consistency and quality, but you know, the one kind of criticism I would have for it is that it's kind of lost the kind of almost, you know, imagination fantasy of kind of those early pieces, you know, certainly there's nothing like what was, you know, like a, you know, tales of black widow cover, or, you know, something like that that's coming out in modern, you know, with, you know, and I can ask you this because it's, you know, the criticisms doesn't apply as much to you. Cause I think that yours have a little bit more, it's not just a mech shooting, a uh, really cool mech shooting stuff, you know, which I think is a lot of the art nowadays. You know, I like like things like, you know, you know, your fire starter art, you know, and uh, and the quick draw that you have out there and and that that uh, Timberwolf D variant. There's just a more uh, I really enjoy kind of your work because of the engaging environment that it's not just always a mech shooting, you know, which is fun. But, uh, but it doesn't kind of capture the imagination as the same way of the other stuff. And do you feel like this translation to a digital medium has kind of, you know, caused that kind of regression to kind of just be a really, really good looking version of kind of a basic scene versus like a really imaginative um, kind of scenario or narrative in an illustration? Well, I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily like digital that might, you know, be responsible for that because, you know, you could, you could go pretty much anywhere with, with digital. Um, it might just be, you know, potentially oversight or just, you know, people not, uh, not focusing in that direction. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put the blame on digital there. There, there, 
one thing I was thinking of though is like when you're when you're talking about like some of the the older art of BattleTech, I think I think there is an aspect there of when the setting was still kind of like raw and you could just kind of uh, almost go wherever with it. Um, and when, when stuff hasn't quite been, I guess, set in place and established, like I think there's more like room for craziness, I guess, and like weird, little diversions like if you look at the at the uh that black widow art piece like yeah, yeah. i i only started examining it closely just the <laughs> other day and i'm like why does that mech have three legs three legs yeah why yeah. why is she stomping on a bunch of alien looking androids what is going on in this picture <laughs> like, but that, that's know. totally true. And as somebody had um, commented, because I had posted it, I think on Instagram, um, you know, kind of that, that Tales of Black Widow, and someone had commented that they had taken the time and extensively looked into a lot of the pieces of the early, te- early battle tech, whether it's, you know, that piece by Holloway or, or the Fox's Teeth, and came to the conclusion that nothing in that picture is truly battle tech. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of just an a interpretation. But... You know, on the other hand, you've been in Battletech your entire adult life and it took you till just recently <laughs> to realize that. So, you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. You have to, you know, so it doesn't, so the, the impact is there and, you know, maybe the, the detail and nuance, uh, you know, wasn't limiting to those people, you know, for the imagination. Maybe it just kind of, you know, holds it back these days, but people, like, need, to be, people need to be all right, throwing in little, you know, weird looking, you know, space suits and three legged mechs in the background, as long as it looks beautiful and capture and i think there's also like some elements of you know just constraints and just raw jankiness i guess um in some of the older stuff like many of the older mech designs were just 50 dollar a pop illustrations that were just right. banged out crazy fast you know not really looking you know 20 years ahead that people would still be you know basing entire things off of like this particular line art as if it was gospel you know and and like some of the some of the internal art like just the little black and white either pencil or ink illustrations you know you know many of the artists may not have even known in detail what exactly they were drawing it's like oh we need a this that or something else and like yeah okay here we go and there's just certain aspects of the uncertainty and you know the time constraints just created these weird little eccentricities that gave it like character and stuff and and uh well having having kind of been connected to kind of like now the the bigger corporate side of things you know whether it's through prana or catalyst you know have they now said you know, officially, you know, and you can be specific with your answer in general, like of ignore that. It's okay. You know, even though that was a predecessor, ignore that mech, completely redo it or like, or use this as your guide and not that as your guide. Um, You know, kind of as you've gone through that process, you know, whether it's, you know, I know you've done mostly mechs and not so much characters, the characters have been all over the place, you know, so. uh, Yeah, I I think Battletech probably still has like, there's no real Uh, there's examples of but i don't think there's been any like set in stone of Mm -hmm. you know this is how characters look and frankly it's it's a big setting across a lot of planets it's a big universe so there is always room for all sorts of you know non-standardized appearances it's not like warhammer 40k where like every space marine you know has a certain right you know look across the board um but like as far as you know how like what to ignore what not to ignore like i a lot of the times i'm kind of left up to my own devices and then get feedback kind of like after the fact of like oh hey can can we make like the fists larger on this or smaller or you know can we change the composition thereof but 
Um, it's not, it's usually not anything too, too nitpicky, I guess. Gotcha. I know even, you know, kind of for me and kind of exploring my imagination when I, you know, take something, you know, example, like, you know, a, a shadow hawk or something, you know, kind of the modern version of the shadow hawk, you know, versus kind of the old Dugram, you know, style. And I kind of think it was like, well, you know, after 300 years of, of repairs and, and refits and whatnot, you know, maybe it's both, you know, maybe it came out of the factory line, you know, in the Dugram look. And, you know, after 300 years of, you know, being blown up and put back together again, it looks like, you know, the HBS, you know, uh, you know, shout out that's, that's bouncing out there a little bit more mechanical and, you know, kind of, if you, you know, just occurs to me, you know, saying this, that you can tie it into star Wars and you look at like episode one ships versus, you know, episode four ships, you know, and it's just yeah. kind of like things, you know, when, when things aren't as, as stable politically, then, you know, you got to use what parts you can and, you know, it yeah. might be the same ship, but you know, the, the Y wings from clone wars don't look like the Y wings in episode four, you know, it's because it's, you know, they do the same thing. It's still a Y wing, but it's a lot more gritty. You know, yeah. So, and, so. and honestly, like that would be something that I would love to, to see explored. Unfortunately from, you know, production standpoints, like, you, you you probably don't have the the time or budget to make like 10 different atlases when you're still trying yeah, to make cool. like a broad sweep of uh of different mechs so stuff mm -hmm. ends up i guess artificially standardized even though you've got like 300 or more years of production mm -hmm. lines of like a given mech in some cases um and like it, you look at a a Mustang from like 1985 compared to like a Mustang from, you know, 2000, whatever. Mm -hmm. They're both technically Mustangs, but you know, they don't look anything alike. Not really. Um, so I, I would, it would stand to reason that the same would apply to, to mechs and equipment and, and stuff like that in Battletech. But yeah, the, the budget and bandwidth to, explore those sort of subtle differences unfortunately i think is out of the scope of yeah it can most. be in <laughs> yeah it can be in, in fan canon stuck in there um but uh you know from the from, i'm always interested in kind of collaborative side and, and you kind of you work with a broad team there in the art department you know at with mechor online kind of you know how does how does your role fit in kind of as concept artist with what everybody else is doing and kind of where does where does your role begin and end and, and where do they come, where do those other people come into play in terms of what we, what we finally see on the screen? Um, for the most part, it's been, Alex, we need a, uh, this particular mech designed. I designed the mech and it just kind of goes off to the modelers and animators and texture artists and designers. Um, like, the designers are usually putting on like the hard points, the animators are doing the animations, the texture artists are doing all the skins for it, as well as like the base skin. Um, modelers end up having to figure out like all the damage states and, you know, um, and like destroyed states and, you know, how the, how the weapons that we've made like fit on the chassis and all that kind of stuff and you know uh, and that's and weapons is uh, a topic that someone had kind of brought up and in one of the forums is just like the the work that you've done just in terms of uh bringing consistency in terms of kind of the look of the weapons you know mm -hmm. and the, the function of the weapons whereas you know it's definitely not that way kind of in a lot of the earlier line art uh, from one from un one unit to another, kind of what you know in terms of that process. What have been kind of the the kind of hurdles that you've been that you've had to troubleshoot in terms of you know creating that 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 new consistency and that new method of of designing weapons that need to be used for a variety of different designs. So initially, um, very early on in Mechor Online, we didn't have that standardization at all, um, and then. Late, sl sometime later, we started trying to get some standardization, and then eventually we ended up going towards a a modular system. I would say m much of that was mainly due to 
how many headaches were being caused production wise by not having uh, like a standardized thing because it it was a a massive time sink to not only figure out you know the overall scale of weapons for like a just a given mech compared to other mechs but like how do we how do we fit in extra weapons once you start customizing it and how big are those extra weapons and you know it, it unfortunately I, I i can't say it was so much of an intentional thing as far as like aesthetics go because you know in my opinion or not opinion but like just as an artist i would love to just have one off you know everything <laughs> everything gets like a a nice cool customized housing mm -hmm. but unfortunately just from like actually getting things done at a reasonable amount of time um it was just not something that was workable long term so being able to have like a more standardized approach to the weapons so that you know you know that a medium laser is going to be x big and probably uh fit into these types of housings made it a lot more um, like functional and efficient for for getting designs done and where we could you know we tried to make like a few exceptions when like a mech's appearance was very much based around something that could not be easily standardized like like uh, like if we followed the the modular logic for doing like the rifleman for example like we'd end up with these tiny little barrels underneath the uh, underneath the ac5s and i'm like no the rifleman has two long barrels it's got to have you know long lasers so like we ended up stretching those things out we made the exception but unfortunately we can't make a million bazillion exceptions Fine. so what are what are some kind of areas that that you would be excited to kind of explore moving forward you know places that you you know haven't really gone whether it's kind of mech designs or kind of concepts that you haven't been able to kind of put into that digital medium yet uh something i've always wanted to like do more exploration of is uh is like weapons and equipment okay i guess uh it's just one of those things that i'm just kind of i don't know just weirdly interested in because it's just one of those aspects of battletech of like you know how these mechs actually blow each other up or you know interfere with each other or interface with each other um like yeah, like I, I'm interested in how this AC-20 actually works, you know, what kind of calibers is it, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of forms certain types of equipment take mm -hmm. um, and like what kind of variety there is in terms of like the overarching setting. Like, yeah. Have you had any kind of influence in Sazers in terms of how MechWarrior Online kind of portrays those weapons and how they discharge and look? You know, certainly kind of the PPC has gone through so many different iterations. Oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> the video games, you know, what, uh, you know, is there, have you been involved in that process? And, you know, are there any things that you really like about, you know, how MechWarrior has interpreted or kind of ways that you want to kind of explore a little bit further? Oh, I, I originally did want like, uh, like weapon manufacturer variety type of stuff, unfortunately. Okay. You know, some of that sort of fell out of scope. Some of that is still kind of expressed in there. Um, I did end up like advocating for uh, like the burst fire ACs mm -hmm. and the uh, the stream fire LRMs. Um, but uh, like, if it was up to me, I, I would have gone very crazy with it. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> give us give us an example. Can you share? You know, what's what's kind of a direction you go that just kind of breaks the mold? that you kind of uh, have in your head? Well, like the, uh, the, uh, the people that are doing, uh, the guy that's doing like uh, the Merc Tech mod for MechWord 5, 
pretty good example. Like he's kind of already doing what I sort of already wanted to do, I guess. Okay. Just go like weird levels of detail in terms of different fire rates, uh, different um, projectile velocities, different types of damage and ammo and, you know, all sorts of weird performance niches and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and the, the way I kind of always imagined it, you know, was that, you know, using lasers, you know, small, medium, large lasers as examples, you know, that it's not like this, this company produces a medium laser and this company produces a large laser and this company produces a small laser. It's just these companies produce lasers and they run this huge gamut. You know, they all, they all damage things, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, they, they're classified in medium just because it's a laser that happens to do damage within that range, you know, yeah. of what would be medium and, and large is in that range of what would be a large beam, you know, but whether it's kind of, you know, a pulse or consistent, you know, a consistent beam or whether it's red or green or whatever it may be, you know, that uh, that's all just kind of very specific to the manufacturer, not necessarily to the laser. But, but like pie in the sky, like if I had, you know, infinite budget or whatever, I, I would have loved to do something like, you know, almost borderlands level of, you know, weapon variety and just, mm. unfortunately, you know, from a gameplay standpoint, you know, it, you could say it would definitely like muddy the waters because I would love to have, you know, medium lasers that maybe almost do the damage of a large laser, but their range is like, you know, completely garbage and their heat is through the roof or, yeah. and they maybe explode or just, you know, all sorts of like weird little, you know, niches here and there or having, you know, some LRMs that are garbage for indirect fire, but like great for brawling and mm -hmm. others that might be awful at direct fire, but like they're great for rocket artillery or, you know, maybe, uh, you know, some machine guns that are closer to automatic grenade launchers than typical machine guns. Um, oh, uh, I, I guess one thing that is kind of, uh, I guess a fingerprint I, uh, of my input, I guess in Mech Warrior 5 as far as weapons behavior, but I did push pretty hard for having uh, ballistic weapons not have a hard range cutoff. Okay. Um, rather proud of that because I always advocated that it is a lot more satisfying to arc an AC-20 at long range and <laughs> still hit something rather than have the shell magically disappear, disappear. at, at uh, an arbitrary range. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I just like realistic weapons, I guess. So um, I, you know, going, going into that PPC, kind of what, uh, you know, because that's the one that seems to have the most variety, you know, what do you imagine a, a PPC discharge to, to look like and sound like? Realistically, it would probably be almost instant. It would probably just be like, you know, it just a, a quick instant hip scan beam um, with like, you know, some sort of electrical discharge after it. That's realistically, though. Uh, I do like the sort of, you know, throwing a projectile with a trail behind it. And I am nostalgic for the old MechWarrior 2 style, like PPC blobs yeah. that <laughs> potentially outrun. Um, so I honestly would have loved to have like, you know, all varieties present, you know, like having yeah. some PPCs that are hit scans, some that are projectiles, some that are just slow moving, you know, orbs, uh, some that maybe are like, you know, plasma cannon type stuff in other games. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of room for variety because Battletech is really big. So that certainly there's a, you know, almost a renaissance of Battletech happening these days, you know, kind of, you know, is there anything that's, you know, particularly exciting for you or, you know, that you're kind of looking forward to coming up, you know, certainly obviously outside of kind of what you have control of or what you could reveal, you know, for Prana, but just in general for the Battletech universe, you know, kind of what, uh, what excites you about kind of this, this new kind of uh, generation of wave that we're experiencing here? Hmm. Ah. Uh. I am honestly always excited for just 
from from being embedded in the industry now like the stuff that excites me the most is what the fans come up with honestly. okay <laughs> just like okay well there's my my regular work that i'm doing what's going on over there <laughs> well what's kind of most the uh, most fun kind of you know fan idea or suggestion or input that you've you've been able to kind of incorporate either into the game or into into an art piece oh uh I would say I, I like putting like little Easter eggs into into my art every now and then. Not always, but like whenever I get the chance, I really like putting like little gags in there. Um, but uh, as far as like, I do like showing uh, showing my coworkers stuff that uh, that people are like working on, like you know, fan wise, and saying and being like, see. See, yeah. there's that thing that I mentioned like forever and a half ago, and now look, they're doing it. Like... <laughs> well, uh, maybe to give uh, some of those kind of those amateurs a little shout out. You know, are there you know any that you want to kind of you know call some attention to? Anybody out there, kind of in the non-official capacity, doing some great work that you want to kind of uh, you know let them know that you know that you're a fan that you know you like what they've been doing. Uh, like, uh, I'm a big fan of what. Uh... Magnum GB is doing with uh, with Merc Tech. Um, I'm a fan of the Rogue Tech team for like HBS. Mm. Um, uh, Navid is doing some good stuff with the uh, with that uh, reloaded HUD mod that he's been working on. And there's like a few other few other teams that I've been keeping tabs on. Um, that, you know, they got some interesting stuff going on. Um, Project Winter War, uh, and like a few others, also either working on their own HUD mods or doing overhauls and things of that nature. And yeah, I, I'm really excited to see where they end up uh, awesome. taking things. Yeah, and that, that HUD brings me to a question that I almost forgot to ask you, but uh, I want to kind of uh, pick your brain because you've, uh, you've been tasked with kind of translating the outside of the mechs into, into reality. I'm curious what Alex Iglesias is uh, imagining of what the inside of a battle mech cockpit actually looks like. Like, what is, what is in there? Are we talking, you know, pedals, joysticks, you know, neural helmet wires, you know, heads up, you know, what is, uh, you know, just take us a little visual uh, visualization of what, uh, what the battle tech cockpit is in, in, uh, in your head. Uh, like it, if it, if it was just up to me. Yeah. Just up uh, to you. You don't, you don't have any bosses. Just have your imagination. Uh, you know what's, uh, what's I, what's in there. How do, how does a how does a human pilot a mech? I would probably lean away to from the whole transparent canopy kind okay. of approach. I would probably do something more like, you know, enclosed cockpit with uh, you know camera feed type stuff going on. Um, probably be a mixture of of heads up displays and you know internal readouts and probably just for cool factor should probably have like nests of wires and uh, <laughs> and greebles just kind of like comfing you in there I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh as far as like joysticks and pedals i mean yeah i, I suppose so that's never been too much of a uh of something I've focused on or thought that much about, but yeah. like I, I do like the aesthetics of giant, overwhelming helmets, um, <laughs> sensors. And yeah, I, I, I did have a lot of fun playing around with uh, with some of those ideas for the uh, for the character portraits in Mech Warrior Five. Awesome, you know, like going everywhere from like oh, this is just some someone with a hat on or whatever in their mech to someone with like a gigantic, <laughs> uh, like dryer on yeah. machine yeah, on their, their head. head with a little, a little viewport on the front. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. It's funny. You, you mentioned in terms of what you're talking about with the heads up display and not being kind of a, a canopy. I was uh, just watching a, a video while you were talking. I'm trying to remember where it was that I saw. It, and I, I believe it was through the, um, through the new animation that DC Bruins is working on that he hasn't published yet, but he had sent me kind of a draft of the concept art, but he has a, uh, you know, there's a, 
uh, yeah, a breach that is that is uh, kind of cataloged in that a breach of a cockpit, and uh, and you see it was the first time I had seen it in, in an animation or video something where you see the breach come from the inside, and the uh, you see the screen, and instead of just like this hand punching through a cockpit, uh, basically it's like a TV gets broken, you know, and hand comes through it, and the screen goes out, you know, and I was like, oh. That's awesome. You know, so basically, yeah. you know, it, it's not a, it's not a piece of glass. It's, you know, it's just a, a place where they, that heads up, that HUD is displayed on the inside and, you know, you're not looking outside at all, which it's uh, actually, it, it's a funny story too, because like the whole thing with transparent cockpits in Battletech was just one of those things that was a, a weird runoff type of thing that just snowballed onto, into its own thing and just mm -hmm. kind of became established. But like, if you read, I think one of the first Battletech novels was Decision at Thunder Rift, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Like in the descriptions there, like the, what appears like a canopy in most of the art was just supposed to be like a little, you know, protective pane over a bunch of sensors. Mm. It wasn't supposed to be like a windshield. And I think they, they, even, they even called it out as such like in the novel, like it would be ridiculous to have a, a windshield, <laughs> you know? But like- a, a shoot here sign, a giant shoot here sign yeah. on the Mac, you know, you're saying that's a bad idea, yeah. But like, I, I think it was a, I think it was like a whole thing of just, you know, it looks like a windshield and later artists just started drawing it as a windshield mm. and it just kind of, kept on going to where like now it's like well obviously it's a windshield look at all the other artwork that has <laughs> yeah, it as yeah. a windshield and it's just kind of like a self-referential feedback type of thing but like i don't think it was originally meant to be you know windshields <laughs> yeah as, as cool as the uh, battle master looks that's uh, having a, uh, a canopy that's you know half of your torso is probably not a, a great idea in a in a battle but uh yeah i can see that uh, <laughs> Although, I mean, I, I can't see how that wouldn't be a windshield, so I guess I'm <laughs> <laughs> I have to eat my words a little bit there. <laughs> Who knows? It's got to be, you got to figure it out. Maybe it's like, maybe uh, Scotty traveled back in time to save some whales and he, and he taught them how to do transparent aluminum you know, for, uh, for the Battletech, for Battletech cockpit. So they are very strong. They're just clear. Apparently transparent aluminum is a thing. Thing, it, is, right? it is now yes <laughs> i think you just have to bombard aluminum with x-rays or something like that i, I forget yeah. how it works the question is can it take a pvc bolt um you know and live but uh, actually one other thing was uh like i for the longest time i like just in my imagination i always try to rationalize like the nine points of armor maximum of uh of a mech like head i mm -hmm. guess as not actually being like the whole head, but just like whatever passes for the uh, exit hatch, okay. I guess, because you have to have a weak point for being able to eject yeah, totally. through it. Right. <laughs> so the rest of the head would just be torso armor yeah. level of protection, I guess. Although that doesn't really make sense because that would mean that you, know, you could be nailed right in the face in a battle master and uh you know your engine is taking damage instead of you so it doesn't really make sense but I, I, that's how i prefer to rationalize it rather than arbitrarily weak cockpits <laughs> that uh can get shot out at any time well it seems like the mech like the thunderbolt or so that would that would follow very well you know thunderbolt's cockpit is just kind of like you know almost in the right torso right you know just mm -hmm. kind of set down in there but uh but yeah well, cool. Well, uh, this has been fun. Before I let, let you go, let me. I want to I'll pull up a little screen share. I'll show you some of the uh, these CCG cards that I've kind of plugged in for you. All right. Let me know what you think. And uh, once I get them printed up, I'll, I'll get your address. I'll have to send some over your way. Let's see where they are. All right, there we go. You seeing it? I got the Akuma up right now. Oh yes. Oh man, I did that one like so long ago. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. What have you What have you seen, kind of, in the evolution of your own art style over time? You know, what you know when you look back, where you're like, oh, you know, I've definitely gotten better at this or that. Uh, I think one of the things I had a lot more of in like old art is just 
like a nice amount of messiness that I probably should try and uh, and recapture because I kind of miss it. Yeah. Getting through. This is yours, isn't it? It's yeah, uh, yeah. It was hard to find the credit on this these images. Yeah, this one's one of my favorites. <laughs> the fire starter is definitely a mech I loved as a kid. One of my uh, one of my custom mechs that I made was based like a fire starter variant, and it had uh, two two compartments in its uh, in its chest that it can kind of walk into a lake and fill up with water, so it could kind of control its own fires if it needed to. Oh, like the uh, PPC on the uh, on the Vindy. So yeah, something like that. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's some of like my earliest. Uh, oh yeah. Like like I think this was when it was still fan art, and it just kind of uh, I was still early on in my relationship with uh, with Catalyst, and they yeah. had me like, hey, can you uh, touch up some of your fan art we want to put in this book? <laughs> and I was like, sure. Excellent. <laughs> You're going to pay me not even for creating from scratch or something I already did. Yeah, you're the only one with good Kit Fox art out there. There's definitely no other options. And this is, like I, like I said, whenever I find a variant that's out there, I love, uh, I love putting that onto a card. But get that Nova. <laughs> Oh yeah, I had a lot of fun with that uh, that particular Alpha Strike cover. Yeah, the uh, the the two the centerpiece, the center mechs are in a uh, in a mission card uh, that I have called Brawl. Uh, I don't have it up here. Is this yours? Can it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love the look of the Piranha. It's just something about it, and it also brings me back to I don't know if you ever got the chance to go back and play Mech Warrior One. Uh, go back and like on an old DOS, you know, uh, proxy or something. But uh, in Mech Warrior One. The, uh, the kind of glitch in the game is you could take the uh, locust and just like load it up with machine guns and just run up really fast to like battle masters and machine gun their legs off. Mm -hmm. And so this, uh, this is the piranha is like a nostalgia trip for me of mech warrior one of just blowing legs off with machine guns. Oh, geez. <laughs> it's glorious. Yeah. The, but, yeah. Oh yeah. I had fun with that one too. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of going back to that atmosphere that I was talking about. It's not just a mech shoot. I like it. Yeah. And I did. Did some updates on the supports there. And I think the Timberwolf, yeah, there's the last one. Oh yeah. That was a that was a really fun one. I actually did a video of me kind of building this, take, taking people through the process. And then Prime. So this is the one you think should be a little bit boxy or a little bit squatter? Oh no. Um I'm happy with this one. I meant like okay. the MWO one. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, those are all my those are all my CCGs with your art on them. <laughs> yeah. Well, very cool. Well, I, I appreciate you taking the time and, and chatting with me, Alice. It's been kind of fun to kind of get in your head, kind of explore that creative process. And uh, you know, I know it's uh, the the fans are you know really kind of enjoy your work. You know, you can see it definitely in all the forums, and they they appreciate that what you've done. Oh, with thanks. Bringing bringing those mechs to, to life and kind of that unified style through MechWarrior Online and uh, yeah, so it's 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 been fun fun for me as a fan and kind of watching it and enjoying it and kind of getting back into BattleTech and having all that that great artwork out there. So so thanks for that. Thanks for thanks for chatting and uh, yeah, thank you. So, uh, <laughs> look forward look forward to all the future pieces that start coming up. For um, I know that I know you're on DeviantArt and uh, ArtStation under Flying Debris Flying Debris guy on Twitter. Um, are there any social media tags? Are you on Are you on Instagram or Facebook if people want to find you there? No. Nah. Just those <laughs> yeah. you're, you're a smart, yeah, man. smart I, man. I I like Instagram. I like the it's kind of like almost like a Pinterest for you know not you know housewives, but uh, but yeah, Twitter. Yeah, like, I don't post enough of my stuff. I am yeah. like years behind. I really should get on that. Well, it's a it's a benefit of having a full time job where you're doing your art is you can you do the stuff you get paid for. It's like you don't have all the free time to be posting <laughs> the, the free stuff out there. But uh, but yeah, but if you do, you know, pull up pull up some of those old hard drives and throw some pieces. I, I'm sure we'll enjoy them. But uh, awesome. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks everyone Thank for you. listening. Thanks Alex for chatting. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you on the next episode. All right.